So we're continuing this uh, farewell discourse, as it's called, in the Gospel of John. Uh, over the last couple of days now for the Gospels, we've been reading uh, from uh, chapters 14 to 17, uh, in which Jesus speaks to the Father very clearly and uh, in, in, very, in very profound terms. Uh, he mentions in this farewell discourse that I consecrate myself in the truth. Right? I consecrate myself in the truth. And I, the, way, the way it's written, it's, um, it's very much, uh, you've got these, it, it's always balanced. You know, um, I have kept those you've given me true to your name. I've watched over them, not one is lost. I'm coming to you. Uh, while still in the world, uh-huh. I've passed your word on to them. The world hated them because they belong to the world no more than I belong to the world. I'm praying not for the world, but for those you have given me. It, it, it's always these kind of these balanced phrases between God's, Jesus' relationship with the Father and our relationship with him. So that Jesus' relationship with the Father is supposed to be what we mirror on earth, our relationship with him. Uh, so when Jesus says, I consecrate myself in the truth, I consecrate myself in the truth. This is obviously something we're supposed to do. Now, as intelligent beings, we should be constantly uh, seeking the truth. And this sounds completely normal. We think these days that because we're so modern and smart that we always seek the truth. But it's quite interesting to see in reality on the ground uh, if we're actually seeking the truth or not. Uh, Just a little bit of an explanation. Um, So there are two kinds of truth. There is objective truth and subjective truth. Subjective truth, objective truth. So, subjective truth depends on a person's opinion. So, what is your favorite kind of pasta? What's your favorite kind of coffee? What's your favorite kind of music? These are subjective. The answer can be something for me, something different for you, and it's not that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. Um, Sometimes people don't always get this right, so when you say you follow Man United or Chelsea, you'll say, how could you possibly, you're wrong, like, now, obviously, people are entitled to follow whatever team they, they, they want, so that is a subjective truth, okay? It's true for them, that's who they like, leave them, leave them at it, grant, even though they may be wrong. Like socks and sandals, for example, we all know, that's just, that should be an objective truth, that's, that's just wrong, okay? But some people think that, that it's okay. We leave, we, leave them in, we leave them in their error, it's not an important thing. Um, so, so, objective truth, on the other hand, objective truth is something that's true for everybody, regardless of your opinion. Okay? Regardless of your opinion. Okay? So, your favorite number, maybe you're, you had the best seventh birthday ever, and so seven is your favorite number. So, your teacher asks you, what's the square root of 16? You say, oh, miss, it's seven. I just love seven. N- no, no, but that's, no, miss, that's just, I just love that number, you know what I mean? It's just, it's a great number, like, you know? Yes, it's not the answer to every mathematical question that you're asked, though. Right? Square root of 16, everyone knows, is? Very good. Okay, four. Uh, so, uh, so, yes, object truth, subject truth, we, ha- we, we need to know the difference. Now, what happens is, in, in the world out there, people get those mixed up. Okay? If, if objective truth, if everything that's kind of clearly right or wrong, yes or no, is considered subjective then you end up in absolute moral chaos, which is what we have. If right or wrong, truth or lies, light or darkness, if that's actually not important, then everything becomes entirely subjective, which means we will be ruled not anymore by reason, but by emotion. Now, while that sounds good to a certain degree, I mean, it sounds good to be ruled by emotion, sounds fantastic. I want to drink, I drink. I want to eat, I eat. But when, when this is lived in reality, it makes us entirely selfish. Because I have an, a, a desire, and a, some sort of a, a hunger, an appetite, and I have to satisfy it. How does that make us any different to animals? You know, who see a pond and go, pond, drink, dive in. They see food on the ground, eat. You know, like it's just, how does that make us any different to animals unless we're guided by reason? So... We're, we should be guided by this pursuit of truth and reason and the distinction between what's subjectively true, so what's my opinion, which I'm entitled to, and what's objectively true, where my opinion does not matter. 
But in, to our contemporary ears, this, what do you mean my opinion does not matter? Well, in maths, in science, your opinion doesn't matter. Now, obviously, you need to have a hypothesis and try and prove it through experimentation. But that's not necessarily an opinion. You're trying to discover something which goes way beyond your opinion. You're trying to show something is objectively true. Jesus says, I consecrate myself in the truth. I consecrate myself in the truth. Now, what does consecrate mean? Con means with in Latin. Consacrare means to, to sacred, to make holy. So I with holy, I make holy. I, I make holy the truth. Keep in mind, Jesus himself is the way, the truth, and the life. So there is actually something more to the truth here than just maths or science. As we discover objective truth, we're discovering things about God and about his creation and about the intelligence of God behind all of creation and the intelligence of God behind the plan for my life. This is actually, there are objective things here because often what happens is as soon as we talk about spirituality, people think, ah, spirituality equals entirely subjective. You know, you, God for you is that, that's fine. God for me is something completely different and that's okay. But the difficulty here is that if our ideas of God are opposite or if they're contrary in some way and can't be reconciled together, then either one of us is wrong or both of us are wrong, but both of us cannot be right. Both of us cannot be right. So then people who have a, might be a bit little sharper upstairs will say, hold on now a sec. You're not talking about this. How can you both have your ideas of God and just kind of be happy with that and leave it go? You're just making this up. This is all make-believe. You have this need for a higher power and somewhere to go after you die. So you're just filling in the blanks yourselves with your, old, your own wild little imaginations. This whole religion thing is entirely made up. And that's what happens. When we make spirituality or religion entirely subjective, it becomes irrational. It becomes ridiculous. It's just basically an adult version of an imaginary friend. I've got this imaginary friend up there who helps me when I'm tired and when I'm hungry and when I have an exam and when I can't find a parking place. My imaginary friend helps me. Well, isn't that lovely? Oof. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, where, whereas... You look at the smart people who have gone before us, you know, these you know, Thomas Aquinas and all of them, the many, the many theologians uh, throughout the ages who like delved into spiritual matters, religious things, looking at how God is and tried to kind of tease it out and, and show that this, this makes sense. This whole system, this theological system, it makes sense. It's not made up and it does not depend on my opinion. I cannot make God. If I can make God, that makes me God. That makes me pretty amazing. All right? If I can actually make God, that makes me God. And that's the whole problem. Okay? God has now been pushed out of the way, and man has been put in his place. So then the ideas of God we have are all entirely contrary. They're all entirely made up, and they're all entirely ridiculous. And any smart person who looks at it will go, this religious stuff is useless. So there's something actually sacred about the truth because it reveals who God is. Right, and the very the simplest definition, right, of God is God is love. Um, Saint Th Thomas, uh, he spoke about God in in a way uh, as um, ens sumum, so like the, the greatest being, the highest being. Ens being a being, sumum, like sumo means you're huge, so the the hugest being, uh, the biggest being, right? So the, the greatest being, but he, he he doesn't stay with that definition on its own. He, goes, he moves on to ipse esse, subsistence. So ipse esse is simply he, well, that that is, that which is. So he is being itself. So his existence is his, he holds everything in existence. He can't not be. It's, 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 it's his very nature to be and to be love. And you know, when, you, when you look at these things, these things aren't, they're not just made up. And it's, it's kind of a sad approach today in religious education that often even kids are asked, you know, who do you think God is? And who do you think God is? And who do you think God is? And isn't that great? Lovely, let's move on. I'll draw a picture of how you think God is and let's all go home happy. 
rather than saying, well, this is what God says about himself. He says, I am your father. I am love. I am the way. I am the truth. I am life. And I ask you to, to follow my commands if you truly love me. And, and I ask you to, 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 to listen to my word. And I want to nourish you with it. And I want to guide you. I want you to be happy. I want your joy to be complete. This is who God is. Not whatever you make him up to be. That's just make-believe. That's, as I say, it just reduces God to something entirely subjective. But just because something is spiritual does not make it subjective. Spiritual realities are objective. Either angels exist or they don't. There is no point saying they exist if you believe they exist and they don't exist if you don't believe they exist. The things either exist or they don't. Just because they're spiritual doesn't make it all subjective. Same with God. God either exists or he doesn't. He doesn't exist for those who believe he exists and suddenly ceases to exist if you don't believe he exists. That just makes no reasonable, logical sense. God is either there or he isn't. And if he's there, how is he? Not like, how are you? But how, how is he? <laughs> Who is he? What does he want? What does he say? This, again, is it's objective. He either says stuff or he doesn't. He either wants things from us or he doesn't. Or he either wants these things from us or he doesn't. This is entirely objective, which means you can look at your faith, at our Catholic faith, with confidence that this is not make-believe. We can be so rooted in confidence that this is how God is, because this is what he says, and his word is true. And he has backed it up by signs and wonders. He backs it up by miracles. He backs it up by the existence of the church. So this, you can actually, you know, just, you know, you might have had this experience where you, you meet some, some smart atheist or something. Oh, this, God doesn't believe it. God doesn't exist now at all, you know. And um, you go, oh, Jenny, how am I going, to, how am I going, to, how am I, how am I going to, 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 to argue my way out of this? Sorry, now, our, our, our foundation is way more solid than theirs, right? So oh, we won't go into it now. I'm time. I'm over time as it is. Um, but, but like, we can actually look at our faith objectively and be 100% confident that this works and that this is the truth. It's the truth. So you can, you can, you can bite into it like and there's something solid there. This is not make-believe. So we thank the Lord today for the gift of our faith, for the, this gift of divine revelation that when the Lord reveals himself to us, what he shows is his heart, what he shows is the truth, what he shows is his very nature. What he shows is that he is love and that his plan for us is a plan of love. That his will for us is our eternal joy. Amen.